Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the final event in our fall Muscarelli Exploration Series, where if you've been with us, you know we've explored the market for art, and it's really been an amazing sequence. We started, I just have a few little slides to show you. We started the series in October with a visit from our good friend and collector, Joe French, who discussed his early career as a dealer in fine photography, the work he did with many of the brightest stars in the world of photography. And then we moved from there. Um, we heard from artist and entrepreneur, Naji Dorsey, co-founder of Black Art in America. He discussed his efforts to grow the market for art by African-American artists. After that, we were fortunate to have a wonderful session with Lou Salerno, CEO of Quest Royal Fine Art in New York City, who discussed his path to becoming a gallerist and told us how he operates a prominent art gallery in the art capital of the world. And then just before Thanksgiving, we got an overview of the auction market from Samantha Koslow, the Director of Business Development and Museum Services at Christie's in New York. Along the way, we screened the film, The Price of Everything, and we were also joined in a special session by our friend, art historian, Elaine Ruffalo, who discussed the relationship between patrons and artists in the Renaissance. But for tonight, we wrap the series with a book discussion on Michael Findlay's recently revised book, The Value of Art. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined in this conversation tonight by my good friend, Gary Ryan. She's the director of the Virginia Museum of Contemporary Art in Virginia Beach. She and I just had um, the opportunity to spend some time together at Art Basel in Miami. And I just wanna say welcome, Gary. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Well, thank you so much, David, for having me. Um, it's been a real treat to um, be able to participate in um, the Muscarelli Explorations. And I really loved the book you recommended and had and really enjoyed reading it and recommending it to friends right and left. I have been too. I thought before we got started tonight, um, because it, because the, the author's biography really is sort of a key part of the puzzle. I thought I'd just go over it a bit. Uh, Michael Finley, he was born in Scotland. And after coming to the United States, he directed one of the first galleries in the Soho section of New York City, and that was back in the 1960s. He ran his own gallery there from 1969 through the mid-1970s and spent a lot of time through those decades all the way through 1984, helping major collectors build their collections. And then he joined Christie's Auction House and became head of Impressionist and Modern Paintings, and then later opened Christie's office in Shanghai in 1994. Worked at Christie's until 2000, and since then, he served on the Art Advisory Panel for the Internal Revenue Service. He served in a variety of roles in the art world, uh, including being formerly president of the Art Dealers Association of America Foundation. So this book, The Value of Art, Money, Power, Beauty, which we're discussing tonight, was originally published in 2012, but a revised edition was forthcoming and we knew it was coming out last month. And so that's the book that Gary and I waited for and then did a quick read on. It's been translated into many languages. His second book, Seeing Slowly, Looking at Modern Art, was published in 2017. This is a man who spends, who has spent a lot of time in the space of the art world over the past five decades. Um, I'll put it out to our participants tonight. If you have any questions, please post them in the chat or the Q&A, or if you have a comment you wanna make, you can raise your hand. And fortunately, we're joined tonight uh, by our producer, Julie Tucker, here at the Muscarelli Museum and either she or I will help to get your question elevated into the conversation. So with all of that prelude wrapped up, I wanna start out, uh, Gary, by asking you, just to overall, what did you think of the book? First off, I thought it was a great read. You know, there's so many books about art, um, you know, who were, whether they're, about individual artists or movements or art historical 
perspectives. Um, and sometimes they're hard, you know, heavy and hard to read. And I found this such a great primer on, um, on kind of the art world writ large, but also a considered, you know, thought, thoughtful way of thinking about what does value mean um, across the many elements of the art world. So I, I, um, and it was just fun. He has great anecdotes. He's had, you know, he's met them all. He's sold them all. He's wooed them all. And so um, it's really, it was really fun. So there, it was a page turner. And I really, I really liked that. He's been in the middle of it. I'll say, um, and you and I discussed this a little bit in Miami um, as we were getting into the book. Uh, for me personally, after reading it, I think it's an imperative for anybody working in a museum. It just helps you to think about things in um, some different ways, maybe testing some of the accepted ways of thinking that we have in the museum world. And for me, perhaps identifying some possible alternative approaches to how we present art and exhibitions in the future. So it was, um, it was really uh, informative. We talked earlier about potentially just laying out at the beginning of our conversation uh, that fundamental sort of opening salvo that uh, Finley puts in those first pages. And he says this, that all works of art have the potential for commercial value, social value, and essential value. But he goes on to say that none of those values are constant. All are enhanced or diminished by the fluctuating mores and tastes of different times and different cultures. And I thought that was a good way, uh, a good paradigm he used to sort of frame out how he would go through the discussion um, as he worked through the book. So one of, the, one of the first premises, and it ties relatively closely to what we've been talking about in our Muscarelli Exploration Series this fall, uh, the market for art. One of the first things he starts with is uh, just understanding the commerce side of art uh, and really the commercial value of art is driven by a wide variety of um, factors, uh, not the least of which are, of course, as in any market, demand for the art, uh, but also supply, um, production versus what is now available, um, rarity being a key driver of the value. and um, and part of the uh, demand, of course, being driven by the expansion of markets. There has been traditionally a strong market for art, uh, investment art in Europe and the United States, uh, Europe and, and the Americas, I should say. But over the past four decades or so, there has really developed maybe five decades, uh, a deep market for art purchases um, at the higher levels in the Far East. One of the interesting facts I hadn't really considered before in the art world, and when you're talking about the production of an artist, uh, a catalog resume is, of course, sort of what uh, one hopes to be able to turn to to understand an artist. And he goes on to say the publication of a catalog resume may have a strong effect on the value of an artist's work because it defines the supply empirically and provides the basis for reasonable assumptions regarding whether any particular work might be available because it shows ownership. Who owns it? Is it in a museum and then likely out of the market uh, forever? Or is it owned privately, potentially coming back into the market at some moment? So I'll just sort of stop there and, and give you a chance to say something as we talk about that demand, the demand and supply dynamics in the art market. Well, I think, um, so I come from a business background um, and was, a, I call myself a citizen director because <laughs> um, I don't have a huge art um, pedigree, but what I have been is someone who's loved enjoying art and experiencing art. And coming from a business perspective and the way we talk about economics and supply and demand and how it affects the prices, it strikes me a couple of things. Um, one is the cost of actually making a painting is nominal for some of these, these. And really what's driving the price is emotion. And it's really that um, the commercial value is really derived from the social value, right? And it's, um, 
It's the fact that it's been designated by the powers that be, whether they be critics or museum directors or curators, that something has value by in the very act of them purchasing it and choosing to display it. So, um, and I think what's really fascinating about his three graces, you know, the commercial, the social, and then kind of the intrinsic essential value, as he dismisses the first two as ephemeral, fleeting, here today, possibly gone tomorrow, we'll only know if it, history will be, um, will really be the judge of, um, of, of that, that, that estimated um, market related value. But it's about a personal relationship with a piece of art, and that's the essential value of the art is how it makes you feel. So I was really fascinated how he wove those three together, um, and also found it interesting that he, you know, he made a lot of money selling art, <laughs> and um, and so I, I wonder if this is his wrestling in some respects with his the fact that he is a deep lover of art and of edited in art and kind of the magic um, of art. He has also traded in art as a and he's he's helped commoditize the, the art market and the way that he speaks about it. So um and I think the catalog resume in some respects is is um, supports that value because it delineates what's available, when it's available, who it's been purchased by, where it's been. So it's just a really kind of messy conglomeration, I think, of, of kind of the economic and social value making versus his, his intrinsic love. And I think that he's trying to, to put that all together um, is my thoughts with this, this, this exercise and this book. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. We talked about this um, uh, earlier on a call and you had sort of pointed out this dichotomy. He wants people to have this personal experience with art, uh, but there's a, a portion of the body of the work in the art world that of course people aren't gonna be able to live with in their living room because for most people, you know, some of these works of art would be unaffordable. And he's been, as you said, part of the commercial chain in what has driven uh, values for some of those most expensive pieces of art. But it is, uh, it, it, it was perhaps maybe a conundrum or a bridge that was difficult in its construction as he worked through both sides of that angle, those angles in um, in his conversations through the book. You know, it, it was interesting, um, and I'm gonna pull something up here once again, just bear with me, our viewers. You know, he brings out a number of different stories and he really was there. He was there on the front lines of a lot of the evolution mm -hmm. of the world of art. Uh, you know, much of what it was, uh, sort of a fledgling industry when he got started, uh, grew up alongside him. He participated and, and in many ways, I think probably helped uh, to create the market as it exists today. But he talks a bit about um, early on in the book about a collector and his wife, Robert Skull and his wife, uh, who was um, a taxi cab business person in New York, who had, uh, he along with his wife had started collecting works and buying works by artists who were considered to be pop artists or some of the uh, early abstract expressionists uh, and bought them very inexpensively through the uh, early 1960s uh, and back into the 1950s. Um, and then decided along with his wife that they would put them out in a sequence of sales, one in 1965 and one in 1973. Um, and so for instance, I think it was, um, you know, two paintings he had bought from one of the galleries in New York that Robert Rauschenberg had painted that he had paid just a mere hundreds of dollars for um, in 1958 and 1959 were then sold in 1965 for $85,000 or 1973 for $85,000 and $90,000 respectively. 
And there was the confrontation, staged or not, uh, between Rauschenberg and Skull at that um, at that sale where Rauschenberg allegedly said, I've been working my ass off for you to make that profit. Sort of where does the value flow? Does it flow to the collectors or to the artists? And you talked a little bit earlier about uh, just who the um, who the drivers are in the process for developing a pricing scheme around uh, any given artist. Maybe we can delve into that a little bit more. Um, yes, I um, I think it's fascinating, and I also think it um, it dovetails with something that's happening right now and very new in the in the art market, which is the NFT, which um, Finley gets to late in the book, but one of the driving one in speaking to the artists that I know who are interested in NFTs conceptually, it's because they maintain a relationship with the piece of art, regardless of how many times it changes hands. So as and 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 that is one of the fundamental um, challenges I think um, with the art market is and I hear artists talk about work that once it gets sold, they forget about it because it's not theirs anymore. And you've got to think that's got to be so hard. You think about how much they put into making a body of a piece of work, a body of work, a series, um, the trial and error, the self-doubt, the self-exploration. And because it is really no long, and it's so intimately theirs, um, and then it's no longer theirs. And that secondary market and tertiary market can take off and all of this value um, accrues to that work that they invested in themselves so heavily in them, but it never comes back to them. So I can understand, um, I can understand, you know, if it was in fact real, what Rauschenberg was saying to Skull, that it's got to be really hard and I and and again that was reiterated in conversations I've had with artists who have put their toe into the nft market because they want to disintermediate the art the art market um but because they feel taken advantage of um by a process that they're not part of post first sale um and right. so um I just I, I find it um it's one of those hard things to reckon. Um, and yet I, I believe that the artists aren't making work for the monetary value. They're making work because they have to make work. It's, it's who they are, it's how they live and how they breathe. Um, but at the same point, um, you know, they have bills to pay and children to raise and, you know, and, and, um, and, and someone's, um, someone's trading on their on their intellectual property of which they have no interest in. And, and it's interesting, um, and I think you're right on all of that. It's, it's interesting that there are these forces then out there that are helping to drive this um, accretion of value, right? So there's essentially um, uh, a marketing exercise that's uh, multi-tiered and multifaceted and involves uh, gallerists who are representing the artist. It then involves people who are buying that work and deciding over a period of time that maybe uh, it's something that they want to put back out into the market. And it certainly is engaged by the auction houses that um, are able to um, are able to get to the place where the marketing of art is a little bit more public, right? So if you go into a gallery, it's going to be a relatively intimate experience between you, the visitor to the gallery, uh, what's hanging on the walls, and the people that are working in that gallery. It's not really something for public consumption. But when you get to an auction, and increasingly in modern times, uh, when you get to an auction, you know there are seasons of the auction market where uh, certain works of art uh, are put out by all of the auction houses in a sequence of a couple of weeks in the spring, late spring and a couple of weeks in early November. And that's when the whole world, or at least the whole art world kind of uh, puts their attention and eyes 
into that auction market to see what kind of values are being driven um, out of that, out of those twice a year spectacles. I think what one of the things we we have to mention is the role that museums play in um, in, in accelerating value value uh, accelerating appreciation because you think about um, the catalog raisonne or you think about just the resume of any given painting or work of art and if it's hung on I'm not sure hanging on the walls of the Virginia Museum of Contemporary Art um, is going to affect major artists value but if it were to hang in you know, in your museum or hang in the VMFA or hang in the National Gallery, all of that, um, all of that is part of, we're kind of unwittingly participating in the marketing machine by giving kind of that third party endorsement that it's worthy to be placed on view, um, loaned to your institution, um, so it's that's an interesting part of it all, I think, um, and it's all emotion based. It's 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 uh, it's um, it's it's how you do how you transfer the brand equity of the Met Museum or or the Whitney or the Muscarelle or whatever, and you capitalize on that um, as an owner of a of a piece of work. In fact, in a show that we had a couple of years ago. One, it was a, the work of um, one, one, um, a man's collection. And he actually took a painting off the wall of the exhibition and sold it. Wow. Yes. Interesting, <laughs> right? You know, what's, what, you bring up a really interesting point, And that is that, um, you know, not only does the, author of the work, the artist, uh, develop a resume over time, but the works of art they create develop resumes over time. We were very fortunate to buy into our collection, you know, about two years ago now, uh, a really beautiful work by the Native American artist, Emmy Whitehorse. And when we bought that from her gallerist in New Mexico, he said, well, we can sell that to you, but there's one stipulation, you have to agree to honor a commitment that we made to loan that work to an exhibition that they were doing at the Barnes Foundation following spring, this past spring, on the collecting of Native American art and objects by Alfred Barnes. And we were um, sort of thrilled by that because any painting in our collection that then begins to develop that kind of a resume uh, just and, and gets that kind of exposure and, uh, and allows other people to see it. It's interesting to us. Uh, MoCA is not a collecting museum. You well, might I, thought, talk about I think that. that's kind of interesting, the fact that you're collecting and, and we're at the mascarella is collecting and we're non-collecting. So it's an interesting kind of two sides of the coin. Right, it is. Uh, but what we do as a collecting museum, you know, the fact that we had that painting uh, that made a trip to our Barnes's amazing museum in the center of Philadelphia, that becomes part of its uh, file in our collection records. So anyway, and, you know, we, we love in the museum world to share our works because every museum collects beyond their ability to present and the ability to share works around just uh, puts them out into the public at that much greater a velocity and gives that many more people the opportunity to see the work. So, um, And we're you, thrilled if there weren't museums with collections, museums without collections would be hard pressed <laughs> to mount right. exhibitions, right? So, but what's, I, I just want to go back when, you know, you and I were walking um, the floors of um, the Miami Convention Center last week. You know, the way you're received in, in a gallerist booth and the way I'm received in the gallerist booth are different, right? Because you're coming in with an eye, an eye to acquire and think about how you can, you know, as you're building your collection and the things that you want to emphasize and build a, de a depth in, 
And then I'm coming in just interest, you know, I'm coming in without a checkbook. And it's, it's definitely a different experience. Um, I think not, not hugely different. I mean, yes, hugely different, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but it was really nice. Thank you for, for letting me tag along. Um, and, and be uh, welcomed in the way you were welcomed in a lot of those booths. We had um, we had a fun experience in Miami in that uh, there are always things that are interesting and uh, any museum director, any of us want to have all the best works in our museum and uh, able to present them whenever we want. But you walk around and you recognize that there are some things that are possible for you as a museum and other things that aren't. But uh, I was walking with one of my good friends, also a good friend of Gary, and we came across in um, DC Moore, Moore's gallery, a collection of works by uh, Jacob Lawrence, mm -hmm. all framed beautifully, but it was a sequence, uh, the life of the slave rebellion leader uh, in Haiti in the early 1800s, um, Toussaint Louverture, uh, and there had been a sequence of prints done based on an earlier series of paintings that Jacob Lawrence had done, but he released the prints one by one from 1986 to 1997. And over the next few days, we were able to negotiate for those prints to come to the Muscarelli's collection. We had looked at individual ones in the past, always with a long-term goal of potentially acquiring them all, but we were thrilled. Um, so just a fun little anecdotal story, uh, but, you know, talking uh, specifically about one aspect in today's art world are these art fairs, these major art fairs that go on around the world that also begin to uh, affect and impact the value of art and the um, prominence of some artists over others, uh, at least from a buying public perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. No, no, go, go ahead, ahead, please. No, the art fair, what I think is fascinating is it's kind of the market happening right in front of you. Um, and one of the points that Finley makes in the book is the fact that you might buy it now, but is it going to really stand the test of time? And he's really talking about contemporary art, you know, because contemporary art, the for the most part, the jury's still out because history is hasn't been written yet. Um, and he identifies several contemporary artists that he thinks will stand or, and are standing the test of time. And you you wonder as you walk through, I mean, it is a massive, massive experience. And you really have to have your, you know, you know, taking your vitamins in order to get through it. And all and all of the other fairs that happen to be kind of um, satellite fairs to that. Um, but there's a lot of heady emotion and the way they make sure that some pieces are the way they kind of gate the the important the people who will actually buy works at with that um price tag they get to come in so early and they've act, you know much earlier than any than even you and I got to come in and they um and they try to make sure that certain works are already sold so that sense of scarcity that sense of um, there's a, like you say, that it's a big marketing machine. Um, and you see that, you really see that at work. Um, and yet what I really appreciated about being in the art fair with you, David, is that you can, um, you come up, you come up, you come upon gems like the Jacob Lawrence set, um, which is really fine art um, that is going to stand the test of time and isn't flashy and is um, sober and interesting and invites you to spend time with it and welcomes you back. Um, and I think um, that's what's so fantastic about that work going to a museum is that um, it won't stay cloistered in someone's home and that, um, and that you can use it as a jumping off point. I think one of the, one of the important roles that, I, that museums play that when where I, I take some issue with Finley is um, I really believe we're education and educational institutions. Sure. Um, and I think that where it's incumbent upon us, art has set up a lot of um, has set up a lot of um, 
gateways for people to get through or not get through in order to uh, appreciate, understand, acquire, live with art. And one of the things is that, and, and as a result, art often and often one of the key complaints about contemporary art is that it's hard to understand or my dog can make that. And it's either too easy to understand or too hard to understand somewhere in between there. And I believe as an, an institution of education, it's incumbent upon us to um, slow down that fast decision making, right? And, and to really encourage people, try to give them ways into the art that, um, that invite them to spend more than 20 seconds, to invite them to do more than just read the label, but really look deeply in, into a painting and come back to um, you know, a work of art. Um, and so he, he really kind of rails against audio tours and labels and, and anything that tries to get, um, that tries to describe the work um, and is kind of an intermediation of, of the experience of the work. And I, and I have to say, I'm not, you know, uh, our job is to, is to, I think, to make um, art as accessible to as many people as possible. And, um, and there's, and sometimes that requires or calls for, you know, stretching out a hand and saying, what about this? What about that? And and understanding the lives of the people who are looking at the art as much as the lives of the artists who are look who are making the art. Right, and, and you know he he's sort of digging deep there, right? Uh, he's pushing really hard for contemplating art, for paying attention to it, for giving it more than five seconds, for not doing, um, you know, visiting an exhibition, let's say, or a museum with the mindset of this is going to be a drive-by. We're going to walk around the gallery really quickly and see everything and touch a couple of labels and get a little information. He's really saying engage and learn. And I, and I kind of took away from him that maybe there's a sequencing issue, right? Mm -hmm. that, uh, that maybe you need to look at it first and understand it. You know, he, he talks about uh, what can be a good interaction between a teacher and a group of students. And he's seen, you know, different classes mm -hmm. walking through museums uh, during his lifetime, as you and I see all the time. And we know the great teachers, and this is the way it's done these days, but the great teachers are sort of asking, what do you see? What does it look like? Yeah. Uh, what does it make you think of? How does it make you feel? Uh, and then maybe following up with that, with a little bit of a story uh, and telling about the history of the art. But I think I think there is some validity to what he's saying, and um, I want to read this one quote because this is kind of where sometimes it breaks down. I think he quoted in the book uh, the writings of uh, noted German critic yes. and dealer and curator uh, who was commenting about some paintings. I think they were by Cy Twombly. And this is what the curator critic had written in his book, I think it was, about these paintings. He said, the primary fascination of these paintings is the experience they convey of a direct mutual infiltration of an inherent formalism through the prismatic di dissection of multiple states of form. And you and I both agree, sometimes things like this are the worst enemy of art museums, right? Because we're trying to engage people. Uh, we're trying to get people in the door. We're trying to make people not be afraid to actually walk in and see what's inside and experience. And sometimes we, uh, as an industry, approach it maybe a bit too academically and in the process uh, are throwing up gates that we think we're bursting open. I think one of the really interesting things about the art fair in Miami, because I think galleries, commercial galleries have the same problem. And even I, as a museum director, sometimes when I'm in the gallery space, uh, the gallery neighborhoods in New York or some other city, I always have to sort of gauge myself before I walk in. Am I ready to do this dance with the people that are working in the gallery or am I not really up for it right now? Um, but one of the great things about being in the convention center in Miami Beach 
is it's almost like an enormous shopping mall filled with people. It's like Tyson's Corner Center, uh, the day after Thanksgiving, everyone's in there and you're essentially walking in and out of hundreds of art galleries that are collectively acting as an enormous museum where you're being afforded the opportunity to look at a lot of art. And in many ways, it, while it's doing weird things, obviously, to the values in the art market, in many ways, I felt like it was breaking down some of those barriers, perceived or real, uh, that people often feel as they're uh, deciding, am I going to go into that art gallery? Am I going to go into that museum? Yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, you know, it's, I think the critic that you just read is speaking to a really different audience. To no, no question. Audiences that we're speaking to, but, but we, I know that, um, you know, not having a PhD and, and reading something like that at first, my sense was, oh my gosh, what am I not getting? And then my second sense was, this is a lot of hot air and they're spending 25 words that are $25 words each to say something that is a very simple idea. Right. And I think it, I, yeah. So I'm, I, I know that this is what you do and what we try to do, which is to foster that sense of that you don't have to have a PhD to appreciate art. And I think that was really interesting in what Finley, I don't know about you, but one of the things I'm going to do as a result of this book is put more chairs in the gallery. Me too. I was hoping we we're going oh to talk about that. Oh my gosh. I hope your plans have, a, you're putting more seating in the gallery. That is such a obvious and brilliant point. Like we it's don't invite people to get comfortable. I think that's absolutely right. And that was, I think, maybe my most enormous takeaway from this book was let's rethink. And actually, we were just having a furniture conversation with our <laughs> architects yesterday. And I mentioned on the call, it was a, you know, a Zoom call like this. I mentioned on the call uh, and talking to Melissa Paris, our deputy director here, I said, um, we're going to be thinking about how we might put different furniture in the galleries than we were thinking two weeks ago. Uh, because I think he makes a lot of compelling points. I can tell you that we, um, when we did Forever Marked by the Day last fall, which was a commemoration of the 20th anniversary of the attacks on September 11th, and we looked at it through the lens of uh, the various levels of urban renewal that had happened at the World Trade Center site through the decades, one of the things I wanted to do was put a table, a conference table in the middle of the central gallery with some chairs around it and some books that people could read more about the various architects that we were talking about. And you know what? It worked. People were sitting there and we sort of were not sure that it was the right thing to do. Uh, it was a lot of furniture to have in a, in a gallery, uh, but it really did work. And then when we did Degas this past spring, um, in the same three sequence, uh, three gallery sequences upstairs. In the third gallery, we put some of the Degas catalogs and some of the information and materials that we had developed around a table. And I can tell you, um, anytime there was anybody in those galleries, somebody was sitting at those tables looking at the books. And they were able to sit amongst all those works that were in that small third gallery. And they were sure they were looking at a catalog, but they were also looking up on the wall uh, at the works that they were surrounded by. And I think that's getting to exactly what Findlay is saying in the book. Let people have the opportunity to get comfortable. Don't make them have a 15 second exposure right. and experience with the work. Give them the opportunity to have a 25 minute exposure and experience. I even think about the art in my office and the fact that I look at a piece of work is right in my line of sight and I look at it so many times a day and some days I just pass over it and other days I'm like, oh my God, I, I, I just noticed this piece of it. And it's been on my wall in this location for a year. I move things around every now and then and it really struck me and I've also heard... Um, 
And, you know, there was that wonderful story about the woman in Montana who bought the Picasso because she loved it so much. It was something she'd experienced as a child. But there are pieces of work that people visit, you know, in a, in a museum because they want to come back and see it again and experience it anew with the eyes that they have that day versus the eyes they had a year ago or a month ago or a week ago. And this is one of those. Um, and I think I'm so glad he included it because it, it really gives to me the, it's a really interesting example of where what he loves about art, which is the essential, you know, the essential love of the object and of what's portrayed and brings in his commercial world. So the woman who brought, bought this, who was anonymous in the book, she was someone who'd come into a, a lot of money. And however, I don't know how they became, and she was lived modestly until she came into that, into that inheritance. And I don't know how he, how she and Finley came together, but there was only one picture she wanted, and it was this picture. And it was a picture I think she she discovered in high school or as a young woman, and just um, just fell in love with it and and revisited it and had that 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 relationship with it. And when she came into this inheritance, she said to him, "This is the only one I want." and I will buy it. And he was so pleased to be able to find that work for her and kind of consummate that, that love um, that she had. And then to know that she didn't want to be back in the art market. She hung it on her wall. People assumed it was not real because here she was and kind of not in a, you know, I'm sure it was a lovely house, but who has a Picasso hanging on their wall, you know, really right. <laughs> not many and um and she even said that she left her door unlocked and that's how so i i just love that story because you could see him kind of relishing the experience of fulfilling that love um even though it it was a commercial transaction in, in the midst of it all now, you could tell that that story uh, was one that really moved him, that he felt like, wow, this is the exact person uh, that I want to be meeting every day. Someone who's just going to take a piece of art and love it. And, and Gary, you know, right? Gary, he also told that story about Dorothy and Herbert Vogel, uh, mm -hmm. those civil servants who lived in oh, New right. York, yes. working at the post office and I think that maybe the New York Public Library. And never having made uh, very much money, but they lived a frugal life with the idea that they would always use his salary for their living expenses, but they loved art so much that they would use her salary to buy art. And they just became fixtures in the gallery scene. They went to all the gallery openings. I think someone referred to them, maybe it was Rauschenberg, as the mascots of the art world. Uh, they would just show up everywhere and they would buy in many instances, relatively modest works by these artists, but they ended up collecting thousands of works over time that they largely were storing um, in their apartment and maybe one their small apartment and maybe one other space, and then never looking to monetize it. And this is what he, I think he loved about them was that they loved art. They wanted to be with the art. They wanted to experience the art. They wanted to understand it through a prolonged relationship with it. And uh, there was no ulterior motive. No, they, they weren't. It. They, they weren't in it for the money it. at all. Right. And then they decide that uh, this is art that ought to be enjoyed by everybody. And rather than uh, ensuring an awesome retirement in um, on, in the south of France, they decided that they would give it all to the National Gallery. And they chose the National Gallery really interestingly. Uh, because the National Gallery is free, you don't have to pay to get in, um, versus uh, some of the other New York museums where you do have to pay to get in, or they strongly encourage you to pay to get in. The National Gallery is free every day and open to everybody, and it uh, doesn't matter if you're American or not American. An American who goes to Paris is going to pay to get into the Louvre, but a Parisian who comes to Washington is going to walk right into the National Gallery. They loved that about it and gave this... Uh, 
enormous gift of all these artists and works that they created as they were emerging um, in the abstract scene or just in the contemporary art scene. Uh, I think through that the, looks like a picture of a Christo installation. They have a lot of Christo in their yeah. collection. I was looking through their collection uh, records at the National Gallery. What's interesting as well is the National Gallery kind of got a little bit too much art from them. And so they did a program not many years after the gift where they get, gave 50 works to 50 different museums in all 50 states. So they sort of spread it out, which is also just a beautiful gesture, but speaks so much to what Findlay is talking about in this book to sort of just embrace and love and be with the art, make it become part of you. I thought one thing that was really interesting that he said, and I, it's related to what we've already been talking about, uh, but it kind of struck me in a way that I hadn't really thought about it before. And I want to just read this quote. It's from page 193. He goes on to say, and this speaks a little bit between us having to mediate our role as an educator. And as our um, deputy director likes to say, we're always aiming to create our labels in the museum so that they're informative enough to be enjoyed and written well enough to be enjoyed and understood by a fifth grader, but written in a way that they wouldn't insult someone with a PhD, um, which was interesting. But, you know, he goes on to say in this quote, he says, um, art criticism, no matter how eloquent or erudite, attempts to use one language to describe another very different language, but with no dictionary to assist in the translation. Painting, sculpture, drawing, and other visual media on the highest level represent the creation of a language that is not read or spoken. And so um, the, the, the act of making the art is saying something, but they're saying something through their art. They didn't write it down as a paragraph. And I thought that was really uh, sort of an interesting perspective by him. I, and I also think, you know, um, I, I think his, his yardstick of um, feeling and connection um, and kind of what for him defines good art. Um, I really like that. I think I think as we think about what we do at Virginia Mocha, and we've we've really refocused kind of our our the way we orient our mission. We've written our mission, which is all about experiencing shared humanity, um, and that art is a means to an end. And I and and Finley kind of um, speaks to that at the latter part of the book about how really. Um, that the art that's going to stand the test of time is the art that's going to connect us, um, regardless of where we come from. It's going to speak to us on a very human level. Um, and, and I think in order for it to speak to us, we have to be willing to listen. And, and as museum directors, it's incumbent upon us to um, to try to facilitate that listening, whether it's through the labels we write and the approach we take or the seating we provide or um, the fact that there's space on, on, in our buildings where people can convene and get together afterwards and have a cup of coffee and wonder what, you know, talk about what they said or just reflect on what they said. So um, uh, I, I think in, in my role as a museum director, that's one of the things that um, helps me get up in the morning and you know makes me want to get up in the morning and go, which is the whole idea of, of connecting people um, that might not have spent time with one another, whether it's the, the artist and the viewer, or it's the people who go on an art trip with us that have maybe have never shared a cup of coffee, but what they're finding is that this experience through art is something that brings them together and allows them to better get to know each other. It's absolutely true. I think he makes the point that some people are lucky in that they have exposure to art at a young age, at experiencing art to a young age. It's not always just making art, but it's understanding that other people make art and that other people are making things that are beautiful uh, and that have value and that um, need to be considered. And you know, you and I both have institutions that work with the public school systems, but I think both of us would love to see 
100% of the public school students, the school students generally passing through our museums at some mm -hmm. moment in time, and we're not anywhere close to that percentage. But those are those opportunities to get somebody uh, exposed to the world of art, exposed to walking in through a museum's door uh, and not feeling like they didn't belong there. Because yep. once you're in, once you're inside, I think it's pretty easy to recognize that you're welcome um, if you open your eyes. I think we all work really hard to make it feel like a, a warm environment. I always say to people, sometimes I'll walk up to someone who's whispering and I'll say, don't whisper. This is about life. This is about living. It's not about being quiet. Be, you know, live your life in here. Become part of uh, uh, the atmosphere you're in. It's really just a great way to, to be. So um, hopefully as time marches on and as the world uh, evolves, we'll be able to get more and more young people on the road to becoming adults who feel comfortable about coming into museums, about experiencing art, about paying attention to art, about diving deep into a piece of art through those repeated experiences like you with the art in your office or the art at your house or any of, any of our uh, uh, viewers who are joining us tonight, the art that they live with. I know I have the exact same experience. I, I've had this keen bush hanging behind me in my office now for uh, about three years. And we were just talking about how we're moving very soon. And my keen bush is going away for a very long time. <laughs> and I get joy every time I walk in my office and I see it there. And sometimes like you, I'll spend a few moments looking at it. We've had the good fortune of being open to art. And I think our mission is figuring out how we help other people to have the good fortune of becoming open to art uh, and starting them at a young age and then nurturing and traveling with them as they go through their own life experiences and uh, make museum going a part of their lives. Well, one I'm thing gonna... I'd recommend is this book, if anyone is still shopping out there for the holiday season, this is a great book. This could be under, you know, this could be a great gift. Doesn't exactly fit into a stocking, um, <laughs> but but it it's a, it's it's really it's it's a and it'd be a fun thing to you know share or you know like we're talking tonight. You could talk to your family or talk to your girlfriends or talk to your book club. But I would really encourage for those of you who've gotten a taste of the book and may have read part of it, maybe all of it, but share it. I think that's. That's one of the ways that art actually gets out into the world is by a, one human being saying to another human being, come see this, come read this. Um, I want to share this with you because it demystifies and humanizes that process. So I encourage everyone to um, to get into the Muscarel before you can't come down to Virginia Beach, but get this book um, and, and share art, share it. <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more. Um, let me just uh, open the floor for a minute. I didn't see any questions pop up in the chat or the Q&A, but um, do any of our listeners and viewers tonight have anything they'd like to say or, or ask a question about? You're welcome to raise your hand. Um, but if not, uh, I'll say, uh, Gary, why don't you just tell us what's going on at Virginia MoCA? Well, there's a lot going on in Virginia Mocha, and we'd love to see you. It's only 45 minutes without traffic from Williamsburg or the Williamsburg environs. Right now on view, we have two exhibitions. One is entitled Made in VA, which is it's the 25th or sixth year of a curated exhibition, of a juried exhibition um, of work by artists living and working in Virginia. And one of the things that Virginia Mocha is committed to is really raising the profile of artists in our area. Um, and so what we, we invite um, curators from really significant national um, institutions. This year it was uh, an assistant curator from the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. Last year it was a curator, assistant curator from the Guggenheim, the year before the Brooklyn Museum of Art, to, um, to, to pick um, out of over 500 artists that applied, only 29 of them um, were wow. selected for, for, um, for exhibition. 
Um, and it's just, a, it's a really, it's a really wonderful um, way of knowing what's going on in, in the Commonwealth. And paired with that is a, ser a second in a series where we, we look at basic human needs. Um, and the basic human need we're looking at um, through this exhibition is the need of shelter and housing. And so we take um, subject matter, matter experts and they provide the inspiration for artists that we commission. We started this during the pandemic when artists um, were suffering you know, really, you know, all of their sources of revenue were drying up and how could we take our small budget and apply part of it and help support the creative community. So it's a fantastic, um, it's, it's the way of taking really hard subjects um, like homelessness, that are very hard to internalize and really understand if you don't experience it yourself. And we have an artist help, you know, render that in a way that um, that makes it makes it more real. And then in the spring, I'm super um, pleased and proud to let everyone know that we're bringing the work of Carol Walker um, to the museum. Um, it's, it's a touring really exciting. It's a touring exhibition that was originated at the Frist. Um, the former director there, Susan Edwards, was asked to curate a show out of the collection of, of Jordan Schnitzer, who's one of the uh, premier collectors in the United States, and she, show, she chose to select 80 works in his collection by Carol Walker. And so it started at the Frist, went to Cincinnati, went to Jacksonville, it's coming to Virginia, and then it's going to LA. And the thing I think that's quite um, quite moving about the presentation in, Vir in Virginia is that actually the first ship that, you know, slavery was founded or took root in Virginia and the white lion actually landed 30 miles away from the location of the museum and we're working very hard to kind of bring that forward um, and understand kind of what the role and responsibilities and the conversations that um, are hard to have but maybe we need to have more of them and this and this exhibition can help us do that so we hope to see you soon. Well, it's a lot of fun. And I'll just also note in some of your existing exhibitions, I think William Mary's own Brian Credatus. Yes, our oh, professor I forgot to of say print that. Print. Yeah. Brian was in Maiden VA last year, and now he has his um, first museum solo show. His work, it was all done during the pandemic. He's such a phenomenal printmaker and <laughs> painter. Um, and then the other thing we share, David, is that um, Roberto Humora. His work is in both of our exhibitions, and you did a print with him. We did, and we have a wonderful work of his hanging right uh, in our entryway as well. Um, and he's a great guy, another yes. uh, Richmond-based artist. Yes. Well, um, I'll also uh, just make a few final comments and pitches. We are in our final days here at the Muscarelli Museum in our current form. Our exhibition, our final exhibition, which is an amazing collection of works by the studio art faculty here at William & Mary. Closes on Sunday, so if you haven't seen it yet, please come in. People like Brian Credatus are featured in this exhibition as well. Uh, we'll be closing, reopening in a temporary location and collaborating with a lot of arts venues around the city, around Williamsburg over the coming uh, 18 to 22 months and oh, then like Virginia Beach too. <laughs> yes, uh, without without question. And then reopening in uh mid 2024 August September ish uh in our new in our new venue which is going to be a lot of fun. Um I want to thank you Gary for joining me tonight. This is a lot of fun. You're a great friend yeah. and uh we have a great group of museums and uh, museum staffs spread around the metropolitan area, and we're all getting more and more to know each other, which is really great. Uh, a lot of good relationships over the years and even more today. Uh, but it's a thrill to have you with us. I hope everybody enjoyed being here tonight. I want to thank Julie Tucker for helping to produce this, this evening's event. And uh, if any of you are around in Williamsburg tomorrow, we're having our final party at the museum from five to eight. So you're all welcome to come in. We'll have, have a, a great evening, everybody. Thank you, David. Thank and you. And thanks Wonderful. for being here. Take care.